Hello and welcome to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host, Titus, and today I bring you a special edition of the podcast in memory of the upcoming 20th anniversary of 9-11. We will be doing a series of podcasts on 9-11 and cinema. We feel that enough time has passed that we can get perspective on the influence of these events on cinema in America. And of course, the wars started by 9-11 seem to have ended with the retreat from Afghanistan. This is a good time to reflect on America in the 21st century, not to despair, but to face the uncertainties and the failures that have brought us so much trouble. The country is now so divided that it is not obvious that even 9-11 can bring everyone together. But this remains the only major event that has affected America as a nation, and everyone knows this. 9-11 is important for political reflection because it brings out the good and the bad in America, the power and the weaknesses. It is perhaps possible even to see how all these things come together. There is not very much that cinema can contribute to such reflection, but there are some things. I have to start, however, with some explanations about the meagerness of cinematic reflections on 9-11. The movies fall into three categories, mostly. The most impressive reflections on 9-11 are, in fact, in fictional settings and in fantasy as a genre, and this makes them less than useful, at least for an introduction, but less than useful for American memory. After all, an entire generation has grown up after 9-11 without any memory of 9-11, and cinema would once have been considered a part of their access to those events and to the lives of their parents. But I think it's easy to explain why fantasy movies were so invested in the event. It was such a momentous change it was so unpredictable that it revealed what it really means to be human. The depths and the heights, the things that fantasy aspires to show over against our ordinary lives. The ordinary ceased on the morning of 9-11. It has returned, but we have never forgotten the extraordinary and that it concerns us and that is inside of us. Of course, since fantasy is the dominant genre in cinema anyway, it was the most obvious place to turn. That's where the artists already were. Then the second category has as obvious a reason. The indie movies that had something to do with 9-11 in a tangential way, often, often in a way that seems trivial and even desecrating. These things happened because, again, the artists were already there people who make movies on small budgets with very little interest or ambition are, if not a dime a dozen, then certainly more than all the festivals put together can accommodate. But since these things have been absolutely ignored by the American public and have left no memory in cinema, we don't need to bother with them. Last is the category of movies that I am interested in today. I will be talking about Oliver Stone's World Trade Center, which came out in 2006. This is the closest cinema Hollywood have come to a serious treatment of 9-11 by a director who has great prestige and great success as well, who has won multiple Oscars and some of whose movies have become influential and are remembered. It's no surprise that Oliver Stone should be the famous director to tell a 9-11 story, since he has always been attracted to shocking things for what they reveal about America, and to war especially, and accordingly to manliness. His opinion is very much contrary to the dominant liberal opinion in Hollywood, to say the least, but he is equally eccentric to the rest of America. There is no director who has been quite as successful, who is quite as enigmatic. Maybe we can leave it at saying that Oliver Stone seems to have aspired to be the next Hemingway and ended up accordingly exiled. Still, nobody else dared to deal with the subject because it is a very touchy subject. What does this mean more specifically? It means that whatever great talent, whatever great story, whatever the production's virtues, there would have been great controversy. To be American is to be more opinionated than anyone else in any other part of the world, and coming together on such a matter would be therefore very difficult. Artists accordingly shied away. 
there have been 20 years of silence from the most talented and most rewarded directors in America. And that, I believe, is a very good way of grasping how unimportant cinema has become in America. It is essentially private, it has no public duties, and it must stay away from the controversies that animate great passions. It can neither educate those passions nor calm them. It hardly offers reflection on who Americans are. Oliver Stone's World Trade Center is an attempt in part to mitigate this problem in a very modest way. And accordingly, the major education Americans will have about 9-11 will continue to be the newscasts of that day and subsequent days. They're on TV every year, this time of the year. They are, some of them at least, available on YouTube. They reveal all the confusion and fear between our ordinary lives and our institutions in their authoritative guise always conceal. Everybody suddenly stopped pretending that they know what's going on and that they know what's coming. When the first plane hit, the shocks started, but when the second plane hit, all innocence was lost. Nobody believed anymore that it was an accident, and nobody could afterwards shake the fear that this would happen again. Of course it hasn't, but that heightened sense of vulnerability, the anger and the shame, these things have abated, but they are still obvious in video documents, in TV recordings. Oliver Stone's movie presupposes that America has not forgotten and perhaps cannot forget 9-11. It avoids almost entirely this aspect of the drama. I wonder, therefore, whether an audience that has no memories of seeing America on television on the morning of 9-11 can react properly to this movie, can understand what is at stake and why it is made the way it is. In fact, I wonder whether those of us who did see things on television, whether most people can understand why all of this, or almost all of it, is absent from the movie. It might seem like Oliver Stone is hiding from things, this daring man is now cowed by events, or that he does not show enough respect to show the reality, even though the movie is based on a true story. The TV newscasts also capture another problem very well. The stories are about people who were there in Manhattan, but the audience is America, the audience of television that morning and indeed that day and the rest of the week. Everything that happened to shock people, shutting down the airports, stock market crashes, what have you, all of these things affected America and accordingly the rest of the world. They weren't simply a Manhattan problem, but everybody was a spectator which enhanced, in a certain sense, the vulnerability because of this helpless ignorance, and of course, in another way, removed everyone from the vulnerability since their lives were not, in fact, in danger. So even the way in which we know about the events, these TV recordings, make it much more difficult to have cinema. There's no director, there's no writer who carries enough authority that his vision of 9-11 should, if not replaced, and at least decisively qualify that TV experience. It's not obvious to me that the great American audience would even permit any artist, however talented, to put them in that situation in any other way than as TV spectators. Perhaps this is why nobody is surprised that great directors have not made an effort to talk to the nation about 9-11. Nobody has complained, certainly. But the strange consequence is that there is absolutely no public statement. No one has said something that the nation cares to hear and to remember. This is perhaps the first time a major event in America, especially a war, has this character. The American memory of the major 20th century wars is primarily cinema both World War II and Vietnam, which shaped America and generations of Americans from elites to ordinary people, inspired a large number of movies, including very good and very famous ones. Nothing of this kind will be possible for the many wars that have started since 9-11. Neither Hollywood nor the broad American audience are ready for such commemoration or perhaps interested. Accordingly, cinema has become much humbler. Oliver Stone told a true story in World Trade Center because fiction seems inadequate to the task. He was suspected as America's most political movie maker with his many war movies and his political biographies and, of course, the conspiracy movie JFK. 
of using 9-11 to peddle more conspiracy theories or in some other way to shock the nation. Far from it, he shows himself here at his most moralistic and even sentimental. There is nothing cynical about this movie, there is nothing anti-American, there is nothing even critical of whatever we might find objectionable, even by consensus. This came out in 2006, when America was already split by war protests and the Iraq war, and the new age of political hysteria was to come and dominate elections. Compared to his reputation, as much as to the political opinion of the times, the movie seems tame. There is nothing antagonistic about it, there is nothing polemical. I think this shows something noble in Oliver Stone and perhaps reveals who he is as an artist. Perhaps this, what we see here, is the good America implied in all his criticism of America in his war movies and in his politics movies. If he seems cynical there, he is sentimental here, and these two things are very much of a piece, or at any rate they have a common cause. To be greatly criticized, America must be greatly loved. Further, Stone got as much as he could possibly have hoped for in order to make this movie. A budget of $65 million in 2006 was not small, though of course it was not a blockbuster budget. His star, Nicolas Cage, had an Oscar and a reputation as an artist. And the movie did well. It grossed $70 million in America, and surprisingly, more than $90 million in the rest of the world, for a total of $163 million. It has since sold some $40 million in DVDs as well, so apparently people still are fond of it. But this was no great success. It is a respectable outcome for a respectable movie. It is the sort of movie that even most people who liked rarely watch again. Still, it is the fitting movie for 9-11. This is because it shows American hopes and heroism. World Trade Center starts with McLaughlin and Jimeno. Our two protagonists, they're Port Authority police and they're getting ready for work before dawn. Oliver Stone takes time to show us sleepy suburbia as well as Manhattan getting ready for a busy day. The odd mix of people of different ages and races and sexes getting on with their day as though there was nothing special about to happen. This is a quiet spectacle of democracy. Everybody has to work for a living and so people get along. They're all strangers, that's what makes it so odd, but they're friendly enough. The rest of the movie, in a way, is only trying to show what is involved in such a way of life. How can there be such an American democracy? On what basis does it rest? And what does it look like when it's challenged? But then the catastrophe begins. The world of commerce, which depends on the absence of fear, is replaced by something else entirely that we don't have a view of. We follow these men as they are deployed to Midtown Manhattan, McLaughlin, who was a veteran of the first attempted bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993, assembles a group of volunteers to organize an evacuation in the North Tower. The South Tower, however, has also been hit and it begins to collapse upon them. McLaughlin realizes this and has everyone run towards the service elevator shaft, the strongest part of the building and the only one likely to survive. Even so, only three men survive, and one of them, Petsulo, dies of his wounds later, to the end trying to attract attention by firing his service weapon in the hope that they may be heard by other rescue efforts and saved. This leaves McLaughlin and Jimeno alone with each other, trying to pick up each other's spirits, trying to stay alive, although they are trapped under rubble, fading in and out of consciousness and trying to avoid sleep to stay alive. And gradually they open up to each other about their lives and their hopes and realize that in some way they depend on each other even though they are both helpless. And so the first half of the movie as a whole has the character of an ascent from ordinary citizenship in which everybody takes part to service to the public, which is a special form of citizenship. In this case, it's the Port Authority Police, but we also see other institutions that deal with safeguarding the public and therefore with enforcing the law. Next, at an even higher level, there is the nobility involved in service but which not everyone rises to. After all, McLaughlin is a special man. He organizes volunteers on the understanding that the mission is 
potentially deadly, and this cannot reasonably be asked of people within the limits of their job or even of service to the public. But faced with the events, even the resourceful McLaughlin is powerless. The few who followed him ran to safety, but most of them died. Only two men survived. These are the limits of nobility, and the ascent of the movie goes to its highest level when it reaches the matter of faith and conscience. McLaughlin thinks back to his wife and his family and his failings as a husband, and his deep love is filled with regret and longing to restore in some way everything he had hoped for in life. Himeno has a vision of Jesus, a beatific vision of salvation or heaven. Faced with their limits and with the catastrophic event, the men turn to faith. This is why Oliver Stone made this movie. He is, of course, not a Christian, but Americans are or used to be Christians, and perhaps in moments of crisis at least this comes out again. It is somehow presupposed in ordinary life, it is somehow the ground on which the other institutions are built, but it is not something we ordinarily can acknowledge, and there doesn't seem to be anything we can do about it without falling into partisanship and mutual hatred. But I suppose that when people watch this movie and they get to its core, nobody objects, nobody complains, nobody blames these men. McLaughlin and Jimeno both survived that day. The movie as a whole, you could say, follows them through the 24 hours. And both families participated in the movie as writers. Of course, many other people were consulted or involved who had been there, whether as relief or trapped in the collapsing towers. Parallel to law enforcement, of course, is the military, which defends American laws in the fundamental cases in war. And Oliver Stone accordingly chose to also give us two characters, also real, perhaps much less known than most of the other heroic stories of the day. Two marine sergeants not on duty, Carnes and Thomas, independently decided to show up at the Manhattan site and go look for victims in the rubble who might still be saved that night. And these two men found Jimeno and McLaughlin and started giving them aid and called the rescue team that finally got them out and to the hospital. This is another example of going beyond the call of duty, doing much more than can be expected or in a sense is even permitted since the men were not on duty. They had not been called to the site and were there in the dark at night. They met by accident but together they managed to save two of only 20 such men caught in the rubble and still alive. The movie got one thing wrong. Sergeant Thomas was black, and in the movie he is portrayed by a white actor, apparently due to the fact that the story was not well known, and apparently Sergeant Thomas forgave the mistake. Carnes was found and interviewed for the movie, however, and his character is remarkably similar to that of the two Port Authority policemen he saves. He leaves his job after he hears the attack. He is a career Marine, having served more than two decades already, and after 9-11 he re-enlisted and served a couple of tours in Iraq. In the movie, he is shown telling his co-workers that the country is now at war, even though people don't realize it. And he also goes to church to pray and to think about what he must do. And accordingly, he decides that he will serve his country and his fellow Americans. Stone focuses the story on this combination of the military and law enforcement. It's not merely accidental that they met. The story has something about it of American character, of the need for service on the part of men and the need of the community for service. But this, of course, can only be revealed in extraordinary situations. The suggestion is that even the life of commerce, which Manhattan epitomizes, relies ultimately on the morality of citizenship and accordingly the nobility of service beyond the call of duty. And on the other hand, the military life is impossible to understand without reference to faith and religion, since there must be something beyond human limits to risk life in a non-mercenary way. So much for the public side of the movie, for the men and their brotherhood as noble servants of the common good. But the movie also has another private side that concerns the McLaughlin and Jimeno families and their communities. They are victims in another way, hoping and despairing that the husband, the father, the son, the brother-in-law, that these two men come back to their homes. 
This, of course, prefigures the situation of war where men are deployed and their families await them anxiously and suffer all the fears that come with the potential for heroic achievement and greatness. All public things start as private things. Everyone needs to be born into a family before he can be a citizen. And Oliver Stone shows this aspect of life as well. I said before that his movie is very modest. But in another sense, it is an education in the basics of politics and American citizenship. That may seem modest in the sense that everybody takes it for granted. But it's something worth thinking about. And of course, to think about it, it is necessary, first of all, that the passions of the day do not overwhelm everything else. This is another reason there are not many movies about 9-11. The passions would overwhelm any other thing, any character, any story. Oliver Stone thinks that in the anger and the fear and the grief, we learn something about ourselves. American power is based in a way in something very fragile, in communities where there are always great tensions between private interest and public good, between the family and the city, between our individual pursuits and our relations to others which bind us together. It was the fear of losing all this and the shock of realizing how fragile it really is that the movie tried to capture because this is the part that we can remember and we can understand and which must guide in some sense even our war policy as the suggestion of families separated from their fighting men leads us to think. Now, Oliver Stone is famously a critic of wars in the Middle East, and it seems obvious now that he was right and most people were wrong, although it was not at all obvious at the time. But World Trade Center has no other criticism of the war policy except what is implied in this understanding of American life. The wars are wrong in as much as and to the extent that they forget the necessities of public policy, that there are families somewhere that need protection and whose sacrifices must be taken very seriously since they cannot be repeated or betrayed. This is a very modest thing, life in American suburbia where a family can shelter in a house, turns out to put very serious limits to moralistic international interventions whose purposes and mode of operation have nothing to do with that way of life. Further, the focus of the movie also ignores the terrorists and that 9-11 was an act of terrorism. This is of course primarily to avoid the terrible anger that was much more potent in 2006 than it is now, although I suppose it is still alive, that is necessary in order to make a film about Americans. The mind should not go off to terrorists and how to deal with them, but go to Americans and what they are going through. It is first necessary to deal with that in order to be able to deal with the other matter well. Religion in the movie seems to indicate two powers in the soul. One of them is to fend off despair, to not die in terrible moments. The other one is to dedicate oneself at the risk of one's life to the good of somebody else, even a stranger, particularly Christian notion, it would seem. But we may say that a third purpose of religion would be to limit cruelty and anger by a loving attention to human fragility and good things that are rare or difficult to protect. The movie as a whole, with private and public things, with noblemen and with faith, seems to suggest that 9-11 could not do anything to destroy American character. It could not do anything to ruin America. Shocking as the event was, it was not a threat to the American mind. By omitting political and partisan things, by omitting war, Stone suggests that that's where the problem was. The things that we see in the movie and the things that we do not were not put together in policy and in the national life. So in one sense, American power turned on itself. Politics became more about trying to transform the Middle East than to take care of America. Now it seems obvious that this is a great delusion, but at the time it may have seemed necessary as proof of American morality and power. Further, domestic strife is also avoided. Nothing about race or class or any such thing is seen in the movie. America is presented as united in a middle-class way of life. This is what we call an idealization, but Stone suggests by his focus that it has somehow been forgotten or it's not taken seriously, or perhaps it is even despised. 
since it is ordinary life after all, it cannot be sacred. Now, World Trade Center as a genre would seem to be a disaster movie. Indeed, disaster movies in skyscrapers were not unknown to America at the time, but this is not intended as a Hollywood production. If it is a disaster movie, the disaster is largely absent. The script Andrea Burloff wrote focuses instead on American character, and if there is any disaster, it is the threat it faces. But there is another reason why this doesn't play like a disaster movie. At the end of a disaster movie, the best we hope for is relief. The bad things have stopped. World Trade Center suggests that, in some way, for all the loss of that day, there was also something gained, that Americans became better because of their mutual love. So this is the work of a humanist artist. Shows us something very ugly and balances it with something very beautiful. He brings up again these great fears and that vulnerability, but also offers a hope and this promise that Americans will turn to help each other rather than turn on each other. To conclude, this is the best that Hollywood, this is the best that cinema can offer in regard to 9-11. And although it is not a great movie, it is very much worth watching on 9-11. It is a true story, but it is not a documentary. It shows artistry, but it does not go beyond the boundaries of ordinary life. And as much as it surprises us to see Oliver Stone make a patriotic movie about middle-class American life, we should be grateful to him. So take two hours and look at this true story through his eyes. Especially nowadays, it is an ode to America we much need. For the American Cinema Foundation, I am Titus, and I hope to leave on this sober commemoration with some hope.